Hi, welcome to London Lights, the program where we feature notable Londoners who have made a huge impression on the world of music, entertainment, politics, sports. And today I'm honored to have as my guest, Peter Brennan of Jeans and Classics fame. Peter, welcome to the program. It's good to have you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Well, before we get started, I just want to read a quick uh, curriculum vitae resume of uh, your background and some of your accomplishments. So Peter was born in England, heavily influenced by bands like the Beatles. He studied music composition and theory at the Western University in London, Ontario, where he now resides. During the 70s and 80s, he toured extensively throughout North America, establishing himself as a guitarist and music director with a variety of groups. He also became an in-demand producer and arranger with top 10 successes in the UK, producer awards and grants in Canada, where he was selected as a Juno Awards judge. Peter has always loved the sound of the rock band with an orchestra. In the early 90s, this dream became a reality with the establishment of London's own Jeans and Classics. Uh, the Jeans and Classics family features some of the finest vocalists and instrumentalists in Canada and the US. Peter has also created and developed orchestra shows for a number of headliners of worldwide note, including Roger Hodgson, formerly of Supertramp, and Martin Fry of ABC, who Peter performed with at the Royal Albert Hall in London, England, accompanied by the BBC Concert Orchestra. Peter recently received the Mayor's Award for the Arts in London, Ontario, and was named to the University of Western Ontario Faculty of Music Wall of Fame. Peter, impressive. Who is this guy? <laughs> <laughs> Great to have you here on the program today. Now, I want to talk about jeans and classics, obviously, but you have quite an impressive uh, history. You're a very talented guy. And before we talk about jeans and classics, Tell me about uh, England and some of your mixing there with rock royalty that I read about. Well, that was a bit of a that was a bit of a dream come true uh, gig. That um, it started as one thing and then it absolutely snowballed into a total unforgettable experience for me. And short of having dinner with McCartney some night, I I, I may not be able to top it. But it all started off um, one night in London, this London, after a show, and uh, going home or, or with some people, I can't recall, but uh, just started playing some 80s material. And uh, it occurred to me, I had to play some ABC, and I'd always loved ABC, very mm -hmm. specifically the Lexicon of Love album, which I thought was a, a complete work of art. And um, so after a bit of wine, I, it seemed that I went upstairs to my one computer and I emailed what I thought might be ABC's management people to say, I, I do orchestra shows. Would you be interested? I think it would be the most extraordinary thing. And of course, with a little bit of wine, all your inhibition, inhibitions calm down because who am I to be doing this, right? So I, I was naturally ignored. And then a couple of days later, I sent it again. And I was ignored. So then I sent back another note saying, look, I'm legitimate, but if you don't, if you're not interested, at least let me know. It turns out that my emails are going to some poor guy that ran a fan club in Amsterdam. Oh. He got it to ABC's management. They phoned and we decided to do four shows together here in, in uh, Ontario, two in London, two in Kitchener. The following year, they phoned up and they said, come to Royal Albert Hall. We want you to rehearse our band with the BBC Concert Orchestra because we want to do Lexicon of Love's 25th anniversary in its entirety, plus a whole other set of, of ABC material that I'd scored at that point. So I got to go over, but at the end of the day, they want to be on stage with them. So what started off as me going to rehearse with the band, I ended up playing the show. Oh, wow. And uh, afterward, I got to meet all manner of very, very cool 80s luminaries. And then I got to meet Trevor Horn, uh, who is god of producers as far as I'm concerned, who produced Lexicon of Love. Mm. And, uh, so it was, it was pretty amazing. I, I was there for 10 days and uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> well, that is amazing. Yeah. And, and your story is common in, in one aspect with many other musicians that have been successful. The Beatles. It yeah. starts with the Beatles, like this explosion of creativity and talent. They hit the Ed Sullivan show in February 1964. Do you remember seeing that show or did you see it? I did see that show. Um, I wasn't very old. Um, I was 11. Uh, but I sat there and um, I was mesmerized. I'd, I'd heard uh, the Beatlemania album coming up to that. I think a, a friend got it for Christmas or the late fall coming into 64. And I thought, wow, this, this is amazing. And uh, it just, it, 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 it was indescribable and yet it was good. And I don't know the sounds of the voices, the sounds of the songs, the guitars, what it all felt like. And like millions and millions of other kids, I got absolutely swept up in it. Great. And, uh, were you a guitar player at that point? And no, I was. You... I, sorry, go ahead. Were you in London at that point in time, London, Ontario? No, I, I grew up in a, a little town called Campbellford, which is um, sort of not, not far from Trenton. Uh, between I was there this Trenton. summer. Oh, well, it was beautiful Don't there. And uh, I, um, I grew up there and uh, I was, I played drums. I, 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 I had this horrible drum set, you know, that I go down and bang on, but I, I, I'd always been really intrigued by it. And so, you know, I, I, I was okay on it, but I wasn't, I was just a kid. And uh, we formed, as did many, many other kids, a, a basement band. And we hired, well, I say we hired, nobody ever got a gig, but we had a guitarist, but, but I played better than he did. And I didn't know what I was doing, but I was still better than him. So there was another guy and he, he had a really nice set of drums. So he was asked to join our, our band and I became a guitar player. Oh, great. So when did you move to London, Ontario? I, I came here uh, in the early seventies to go um, to Western where I was a music major. Okay. And you liked London, obviously. I did. Um, it was a it was a, a different town then. Um, the 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 medical side of London hadn't expanded quite the way it was, or is now rather. But Western was certainly a force to be reckoned with, and um, it was also far enough away from my parents that it was a good thing to get away from <laughs> being at home. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me about uh, jeans and classics so now you're at university in the music program i assume and uh this idea for performing with an orchestra and marrying the rock group type of approach to music how does that all come together how is it born and how do you make it happen and become such a successful uh, well, it was a, it was a long road between my university days and when we actually started it literally but the, the whole germ of the idea was something I always loved. And uh, right from the word go, you know, Motown records or anything else, when I, when I heard a band and, and that sound of an orchestra came in, I just thought, wow, this is, it just aesthetically uh, really worked for me. So I went on the road after university. I didn't finish university. I went back a couple of times, but I have this, Jekyll and Hyde side to me, the, the one side being the dark rock and roll and the other side being, let's stay at university and do this. So of course the dark side went out. <laughs> but um, uh, I did a lot of arranging in bands. I, I was in a horn band that toured all over the place. And then I, there was these guys called Gary and Dave who were oh, lovely in guys luminaries and I, I became their music director guitarist and I wrote a couple of songs really? for them. and that sort of took us into the 80s and um, I then played in more bands probably many of the people would have seen in bars but you don't want to remember them very well but um, all at, at this time I was also doing a lot of recording and it, and it came about again the Jekyll and Hyde side people would hire me in a studio situation because I if they said let's let's put a horn section on this track that we want to do I got to be the guy that did it or 
because I, I kind of had both worlds in my head. And the same with smaller string sections. Cut to the Chase, the early 90s, Orchestra Lennon, uh, uh, who were then in existence, called and said, can you do a, an orchestra show, write a full orchestra show? Uh, we want to do some Elton John. And I lied and said, of course, having never done such a thing in my life. <laughs> and uh, I went at it, you know, hammer and tong or whatever you say, and it sold out and people really liked it. And when I think back now, wow, talk about, you know, grasping through the darkness. But mid 90s, we thought, or I thought, that this is what I want to do full time. Music had changed for the studio. Uh, rap and grunge was very in vogue. What are they going to do with me? Because I like pretty harmonies and this, that, and the other coming in and layers of guitars and, you know, Queen is God and all of that type of stuff. So the, the climate was perfect for jeans and classics, perhaps, uh, mid-90s. And um, away we went and we did that, that first show at Orchestra London. It became a, a series, then an expanded series. And at the same time, the US found out about us and um, that's how we started. They just, people kept saying, well, what can you do? Can you do this? Yes, can you do that? And you constantly, you're, you're getting better and better at it. So those early, early concerts, I would, oh, that would be blackmail material if someone had one of those threatened to release it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember hearing about the whole concept as it developed. Elton John, one of my favorites, and he's going to be uh, performing with this orchestra sound. Not Elton John personally, but his yes. music with the orchestration. I thought, that is so cool. I've got to check this out at some point. And I did do that and saw some very memorable uh, shows that I'll never forget. We'll talk about that in a minute, but we're going to take a short break. Viewers, please stay with us. We'll be back in a moment with Peter Brennan, and we'll carry on talking about Jeans and Classics, this great London success story. All right, we're back now with Peter Brennan of Jeans and Classics. Peter, welcome back. Hey, Thank I you. always remembered in high school hearing a song on the radio that married orchestra and rock music, and it was Procol Harum with the Edmonton Symphony Orchestra. Yes. They did a song called Conquistador. Yep. And I remember I was in a band in high school, and I remember my musical buddies all saying, wow, have you checked out this tune? It's so different, yet it's so cool. This marriage of rock and orchestra can be such a powerful, tremendous thing. And obviously you, you agree with that. Oh, totally. And I've had the joy of playing that song with the Edmonton Symphony many years later, but wow. I did get to. Um, they're very proud of that aspect of their multifaceted history. And, and I have seen it, uh, you go upstairs at their building and there's a gold album on the wall. Uh, wow the Edmonton Symphony with Procol Harum. Wow. Well, um, there's, there's an aspect in talking to you, if we can talk a little bit about this. As I've gotten older, I've appreciated more about what goes on behind the scenes in music and the tremendous role of the producer and, and everything that's going on in the soundboard and the orchestration and everything. I mean, I was a guy that grew up falling in love with the monkeys on TV and their music and not realizing they weren't writing the songs, they weren't playing the songs, they were singing some of them, but it really was this uh, production. It was almost like an illusion that was being created that this was Monkey's music and they were these talented musicians. Uh, so over the years, that I've, as I've learned that that's not what was happening, I've come to really appreciate the producers and the guys that are writing the soundtracks and the orchestra parts and and bringing it all together and then making this presentation that is so powerful. Um, is that something, is that a role that you like to play? Are you more a behind the scenes guy as opposed to the guy in the limelight? Uh, what's your feelings on that? I, I what, how you described that person that pulls it all together, that, that has these elements and then you, you see them come to fruition. That's exactly what I love. Um, and 
much as I, I really, it's, it's an incredible pleasure and a joy and a rush like no other to stand on a stage, stage and have a couple of thousand people really go for what you're doing and be surrounded by everyone that you're performing with. Sometimes when there's brand new material, uh, the rehearsal is to me, <laughs> that's, that's the piece de resistance because you get to hear it for the first time. And, um, oh yeah, that really works. That sounds great, you know. Um, so I'm, that's, that's what moves me. That's why I do what I do. Cool. It's, it's just, uh, it's all ego stroking, you know, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've just gotten to know you personally recently as we prepared for this show, but uh, I've gone to your, your shows and I've really enjoyed them. And I've seen you up on the stage and working your magic. And I always thought, man, this guy reminds me of Leon Russell, uh -huh. Mad Dogs and Englishman. Of course, uh, Mad Dogs and Englishman came about. Joe Cocker had performed at Woodstock. People saw how great he was, and they thought, we got to take this guy across North America. But he didn't have a band. He said, when do I start? They said, two weeks. <laughs> and so they contact Leon Russell. Leon Russell had been doing this work on Delaney and Bonnie and had these backup singers and musicians, Jim Keltner on drums and Bobby Keys, saxophone, all this. He puts it together for Joe Cocker and they create this unbelievable uh, show called The Mad Dogs and Englishmen. And I just adored Leon Russell from that point on. I see you and I think Leon Russell. Well, it's, it's an amazing compliment. So thank you very, very much for the, uh, the referencing. Um, yeah, I look for that. In, in people, in, in bands, I always have. I, I, I saw that in Donald Fagan in, in Steely Dan, you know, they, they had those wicked guitar players always up front and those hits that featured them all. And yet, yet behind you've got this guy pulling the strings. And uh, I, I think much as he was a killer performer, also Lindsey Buckingham in the Fleetwood Mac uh, aspect of things. When I mentioned Trevor Horn, to do with ABC. I mean, what a magical individual. Uh, Trevor Horn reimagines the 80s, uh, an album that came out last year. You hear exactly the kind of role you're describing when he's let loose in the studio by himself, you know. So that was, that's a very nice reference and I appreciate it, but I can certainly relate to those guys for sure. The, the background for me here today is uh, one of your a stage performances for Jeans and Classics. Uh, it's a beautiful presentation. Uh, I've been to your shows. The, the quality of talent on that stage in London, Ontario over the years at Little Old Centennial Hall has just been phenomenal. Uh, how do you connect with all these great talents and how do you convince them to be part of the program? <laughs> well, the good thing is, um, the convincing anymore isn't too hard because they've fallen. But initially, like there's 33 of us in the, the conglomerate and, and it happened because some, or the, the manner in which it happened is like anything else, people will say, hey, you need to check out this drummer or you need to check out that guitar player or this bass player. And I trust the gang so implicitly, they've never been wrong. And um, it goes way back. I mean, one of the earliest kind of, kind of Canadian names that we ever did a show with, with Orchestra Lynn, was, was Larry Gowan, who went, went out as Gowan. Uh, he's now with Styx and has been for about 12 years or 15 years. I can't probably remember. But th the point being, his drummer came and it was Paul DeLong. Paul DeLong, formerly of Kim Mitchell, one of the greatest drummers in Canada. And... Uh, Paul DeLong loves to work with jeans and classics. You, you talk to Paul DeLong, he says, hey, if you need another bass player, or what about that keyboard player? Ricky Franks, uh, Catherine Rose, Andrea Koziel, some of our ladies that have been with us for, for a long time, they know everyone in Toronto. So it's a London organization, and yet I think out of our 33 people, probably 18, 18 of them are from Toronto now. And it's just word gets out and then there's there's this enclave in the u.s as well all in chicago well i remember attending a number of your shows 
And uh, I, I know people criticize Centennial Hall, but when the package that's being presented, the performances are so good, you forget you're in Centennial Hall, let's face it. Well, that's, that's nice to know. Thank you. Yeah, and, and some of the shows have just been great. I remember it was the event in London for a number of years to be there once a month, Friday night, get at the table, have some pizza and beer or pop or whatever you're having, and to see this performance. And, and there have been shows there that I have never forgotten. And I'll mention a, a couple of them. Of course, there's your, you had some great Christmas shows. Oh, yeah, those are fun. Yeah. You know, sometimes you need something to get you in the spirit. Yep. And it's a week before Christmas, and you're going, I don't have the spirit yet. What's going on? Charlie Brown's TV special didn't even do it. <laughs> and then I get to see this Christmas show <laughs> for Jeans and Classics, and, and I'm in heaven. It's just such a touching, powerful performance. And there was another show you did. Uh, I'm a big fan of Emerson, Lake, and Palmer and the song Lucky Man with that Moog synthesizer. Yes. I remember reading about that show a few months before it, you produced it and had it and performed it and thinking, I've got to go just to see Lucky Man because there's a reference to an actual Moog synthesizer, which I've never seen live in my life. And I remember being there and I was transfixed. And my wife and I are in the balcony. We're leaning over the balcony and we're seeing this Moog synthesizer and the sound just goes, pierces you. And it was just a night, one of the highlights of my musical memories in life. Can you oh, talk about so some cool. of those shows? Well, the, the, the one with Lucky Man, um, it, it, that show, in order to do Lucky Man, we, we, we have to create a bit of a tapestry that Emerson, Lake, and Palmer can fit into it. So we usually do a show called uh, An Evening in Sym of Symphonic Rock or moody blues and friends or something of that nature it's 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 modified over the years but wherever we go the reaction when we do lucky man people are gobsmacked by it because first of all that we've got is a, a moog i say we've got it's don paulton's uh mini moog and you know he's very careful to not clean it because all of its cobwebs and dirt and filth from over the years we feel gives it soul <laughs> <laughs> and allows it to still work um so yeah and it comes out we also do pink floyd and while we don't do lucky man within the context of a pink floyd show he does use the mini movie again in that too for a thing called on the run and uh, he sets it all going so it's an amazing instrument and um uh there is a digital remake of such a thing but as with so many things, you know, this is held That's together with nuts and bolts and it works. <laughs> yeah. I'm so, glad that worked for you. Oh, it did. And, and so many times uh, just inspired to, you know, to hear this fantastic marriage of, of orchestra and rock sounds and the singing and the instruments and the comedy, the banter between you. And uh, I, I can't remember the gentleman's name at piano, Mr. Reagan, I think it oh, is. Oh, John, yeah. John, yeah. Hilarious, hilarious guy. I mean, those were just the best wow. and you've taken that uh, that uh, um, formula to other places around the world uh, where have you played well we've played literally uh, from Anchorage uh, to uh, Halifax Nova Scotia down to Orlando and then over to San Diego so we've covered all of that in North America and uh, and then with Roger Hodgson, uh, we've we've had shows uh, as far east as Turkey, <laughs> and um, all all through continental Europe. And then uh, Roger's done a little bit um, in the UK, but not not much. And then of course we had the the um, ABC stuff that mm. also has been over into France. So. It's, it's uh, getting our toe in the water internationally as far as Europe is concerned. That's on my, that would be a bucket list of mine to, to get Jeans and Classics, you know, with, with, go over with eight or nine of us and be prepared to, to be there for a few weeks and do a number of our different shows. That's awesome. 
Yeah. Uh, Peter, uh, I'm a Londoner. Londoners are proud of what you've accomplished. You've added uh, richness to our musical experience over the years. And we're so thankful for all the work that you've done. And just wanted to let you know that Londoners uh, are proud of your success. And we wish you all the best going forward. I'm sad to say we're running out of time. We're almost done. But Peter, good luck. Keep up the good work. Thanks for being here today. And to our viewers, uh, stay tuned for more episodes of London Lights. And I hope you enjoy them. Uh, you'll be hearing from us again real soon. Peter, take care. We'll talk again. Thank you so much, Dan.